Today's speaker is Mike Stillman, who will talk on the Kuzu property for quadratic Gorenstein rings. Um, thanks, Arena. So, first of all, can you all hear me when I am talking like this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so, if there's any issue with it, let me know. Uh, so, I'm going to talk on quadratic Gorenstein algebras and Kuzul there and the Kuzul property, and this is joint work with Matt Mastroini and Hal Shank. Uh, in those two papers there. And these notes I can make available after uh, the talk. So th this is, um, we're starting off elementary and the first thing we're gonna talk about are the wonders of Betty diagrams. To get ourselves into this. Uh, and so we're gonna consider two examples. So one, an example, uh, is going to be S is uh, just K of say X, Y, and Z. Very simple one. K here is any field. It doesn't really matter uh, what it is. Uh, uh, some mostly will will probably think of it as characteristic zero, but I think everything works fine. Um, almost everything works fine for any characteristic. And then uh, I is for this example is just going to be a very simple ideal X squared, Y squared, Z squared. Uh, x squared minus, oops, that's not right. My notes are wrong. xy minus uh, xz and yz minus xz. Okay, and uh, so we're going to let r equal s mod i. This is going to be our usual notation for today. S is going to be a polynomial ring, standard graded. Everything in this talk is graded just with all the variables of degree one. Uh, the ideal i is, is almost always going to be quadratically generated unless we're unlucky. And then r is going to be the quotient ring, s mod i. And uh, in this case, we certainly see that the codimension of i is 3. And in fact, um, as we'll, we'll see, this is a codimension 3 Gorenstein ring. And so because of uh, Buxbaum and Eisenbud, Uh, it's actually given by the um, I is the Fapians of some matrix of so the, oops, not the five, the four by four Fapians of a five by five skew symmetric matrix of linear forms. So that's just this. We could figure out what the, um, the matrix is. We're not going to bother with that. Instead, we want to just look at the free resolution for the time being. And uh, so the resolution of this will be of the following sort. It'll be R, uh, there are, uh, it's S, and, the, and there are five generators. They're all quadric, so we'll write S minus two, five. And then uh, we have to calculate it, but in fact, we know that this is gonna be minus three uh, to the five. This is the linear, linear matrix M, which is this matrix here. And then we have uh, actually just a transpose of the first matrix. If we do it right, we get this S minus five to zero here. Okay, so that's the free resolution. And uh, uh, so we have, that's what it is. And uh, it's the Betty diagram is the numerical way of, is the nice way of writing this that you might see all over the place, but including in Macaulay too. Uh, and let's suppose that it looks like this. So this is going to be zero, one, and two. These are gonna be degrees. Zero, one, two, three, these are homological degrees. And we just write down the numbers. So the S here becomes a one in this spot. The five quadratic generators give you five guys here. Um, the five um, linear first syzygies at this spot right here give us uh, the five here. And then the final S minus five gives us a one here and all the others is zero. So the, the idea is that uh, if we take the, um, what is it, the beta um, uh, Ji, which is uh, tor, the dimension of tor, whoops. The dimension of tor sub j of uh, 
of r comma k over s and uh, in degree what? In degree uh, i plus j. So this is the, uh, the Betty number um, it's sort of scaled in degree. And then if I, if I take uh, the i over here and the j is one of these guys, that's the given beta j i. So uh, actually it's not, it shouldn't be called beta maybe. Maybe it should be called b. Beta usually is the actual Betty, diagram, Betty number. Anyway, this is what these numbers all are. It's one and then five quadratic generators is here, five linear syzygies, and then uh, the uh, quadratic second syzygy. So the great thing about Betty diagrams, uh, I know this is uh, perhaps a little elementary, but that's what I was asked for here <laughs> at the beginning. So, uh, so the, the basics about this is that you can read off lots of great numbers from this. So for instance, um, uh, this number here is the projective dimension of R. This number here is the regularity of R. Uh, and for the, today, the definition of both of these terms are just, that's what those, the largest number that you see that it actually appears in this diagram, that's what that is, okay? Uh, we can also read off the um, Hilbert function Hilbert series, say. In this case, what is it? It's um, H R of T. So this is the uh, this is the the sum overall dimension of R sub uh, T uh, uh, D say uh, times T to the D, and you can just read this off as the alternating sum of various numbers from this. So I'm not going to go through how this works, but this is the way you just well, you just take all of these guys and you put t's in. And then you have one minus t to the number of variables, which in this case is three. And then you can actually write it all out. And this is gonna be one plus three, two um, plus t squared. So the, that's really the saying the Hilbert function is one, three, and two. So we would write the h vector is equal to one comma three comma two. So that's a kind of be kind of our notation for the day. Um, we can compute also, so we have the Hilbert series, we can also get the co-dimension of i from this, which is just how many times we had to divide by t. In this case, it's three. And uh, we can also determine whether it's Cohen-Macaulay. So r is Cohen-Macaulay if the projective dimension, which we can compute from this, is equal to the co-dimension, which we can also predict, um, which we can also do from this. And so the answer is yes in this case. We can also get is R is Gorenstein if R is Cohen-Macaulay and uh, R is, uh, and the top Betty number. In other words, the sum of all the numbers in the last column is equal to one. So there should only be one number in that last column. And sure enough, there it is. So this one is Gorenstein. So this is a yes on this example. Um, okay, so, so basically, the, the great thing about Betty numbers is, uh, Betty diagrams, is they give you all of this basic numerical information about it, or basic facts about the idea. Okay, I would like to ask if there are any questions, but um, have any questions come up yet? Okay, cool. So unless someone's hearing that I just can't hear anything back, I, I, if someone's saying something I can't hear anything back, I'll just continue. So uh, another example uh, of these uh, quadratic guys uh, are canonical curves. So let's let C equal a just, projective curve. Yes? Just interrupt you for a second. Some people were asking further up if the Hilbert, the H vector was 131. They, uh, yes. they, they can it only is, use it. It is, yeah. in fact, 131. 
Let's change that. Thank you very much. That's good. I'm going to make start making mistakes so that I can get some feedback. <laughs> I just sorry to interrupt again. It looks like people are posting questions only to the panelists, and their answers been given. So they should post it to everybody. That would be better. Right. Okay. That's good. Okay. So anyway, so uh, the second example that we want to consider are just uh, canonical curves, and I'm going to let C be a curve. Of, um, whoops. Change this um, color. So this will be a curve, a projective algebraic curve of um, genus G. And any curve, we have a map. Well, most of them, we, we all have maps. We have phi from C, uh, let's say of uh, non-hyperliptic, but I'm not going to worry about it too much because this is just a little example. This maps into projective G minus one space by the canonical embedding. Now, it doesn't really matter whether you even know what that is or anything like that, but what this means is that if we let, uh, this is actually for most curves, not for hyperelliptic, but anyway, let's let I equal IC be contained in S, which is K Adjoin, uh, say, x1 to xg. So this is the homogeneous coordinate ring. Um, and, uh, uh, and we're going to let r equal s mod i. And so we know that the codimension of i, or the height, codimension of i is equal to, let's say it's a curve in, um, in in G minus, PG minus one, so it's of codimension G minus two. Okay, so for an example of this, uh, to be, to see some ideals here, or we won't see the ideal, we'll just see the Betty diagram. Suppose the genus is seven, and it's a general, uh, a general curve. So kind of random. So then what we have is the following diagram. Um, we're going to have 0, 1, 2, 3 for this. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's always a 1 here. And then here, there's 10 quadratic generators um, of this ideal. So it, we're, in a, we're in seven variables, and there are 10 quadratic generators, 16 linear syzygies. And then there's 16 here, a 10 here, and a 1 here. So this is, um, so what do we know? Uh, because the codimension is, uh, is five, this is what? This is codimension five is equal to projected dimension, so it's Cohen-Macaulay. The top number is one, so it's also in fact Gorenstein. And the regularity of R is three. And uh, what else do we know about it? Well, you see that there's also, because it's Gorenstein, we have, uh, if, this, if these are Betty numbers, let's, uh, let's call these, uh, let's call the Betty numbers um, beta ij. I should have not used, no, no, bij is what I did. Gorenstein says that the bij here is equal to b of uh, five minus uh, i, and three, uh, no, I got it wrong. Yes, I have it wrong. So I is the degree over here, and then J is over here, I guess. If we're, if we're, and then Bij is just the entry at that point in this matrix or this diagram. This is equal to what? The, um, so we flip the I and then we flip the J. So we have duality here. And also the Hilbert function or the h, let's just write down the h vector, which is that numerator of the Hilbert function. And we'll just do it in terms of numbers. It's one, five, five, one. Okay. So anyway, so these are, uh, both of these um, examples are both examples of Gorenstein. I, um, Gorenstein rings or Gorenstein, Gorenstein algebras that are generated by quadratic polynomials.
So these are both Gorenstein, a quadratic generated. So I'm going to use this notation, quadratic generated. Actually, I shouldn't say that, quadratically presented. The ideal is I is generated by quadratics and Gorenstein. So for us, we'll, we'll, we'll abbreviate this and we'll call it R, which is S mod I, is quadratically Gorenstein, quadratic Gorenstein. And so the, today, the, um, all the ideals and, or rings that we're going to be interested in are quadratic Gorenstein ideals and kind of what properties they have. Okay, so, uh, so there are lots of, uh, lots of examples of these, but in fact, the theorem uh, about these canonical curves might be the following. This is due to Petrie, is that uh, if, uh, if C is a curve is not trigonal, which means that it doesn't have a map to uh, a three to one map to, to uh, P1, the projective line, um, and or nor is it isomorphic to a plane quintic. In both of those cases, the, the curve C is, is, is perfectly well-defined and has cubic generators, so it's not quadratic. But if that's not the case, then the ideal, um, then R, which is I mo um, S modulo IC, is quadratic Gorenstein. Okay. And uh, quadratic Gorenstein things have, arise in lots of other places as well. For instance, in algebraic combinatorics, uh, if you take a simplicial complex and you look, you ask for the Stanley Reisner uh, ring of it, uh, it's a, there's a lot of interest and there's a number of conjectures um, involving when this is um, quadratic Gorenstein. Okay. Um, whoops, let's see here. Yeah, let's go back up. Whoops, not that one yet. <laughs> So um, anyway, so we, we're going to then, one example that we could do here uh, is we could look at, uh, let's suppose R is K of X1 to XC modulo I. And let's suppose that this has codimension of I is actually equal to C. Uh, the, and we are also going to suppose that R is quadratic in Gorenstein. Okay, so this is, if you have any quadratic Gorenstein one, you can always cut by a linear, uh, a linear system of parameters to get to something that is like this. So R is this and also R is finite length. Because the codimension is the number of variables. And um, I should always say that um, I'm never allowing I to have linear generators in it. If I do, I'll just get rid of one of the variables and, um, have, and write it in smaller number of variables. So uh, Migliore and Nagel, uh, in 2013, they study uh, quadratic Gorenstein algebras. And they asked for the possible Hilbert functions of these things. And so for instance, when one of the things that they, uh, they show is that if um, the regularity of R is four, so this is a finite length thing. So this is going to be the very top degree of an element of R. So this means that R sub, um, let's call this R. R sub R is not equal to zero. In fact, it has dimension one and R sub R plus one is actually the entire ring. I mean, uh, is zero, so the ideal is the entire ring. So anyway, so we have this. If this is the case, and if uh, the, the codimension C is equal to five or six, or six, uh, the, you might ask, well, what are the possible Hilbert functions? So one possible Hilbert function is one, five, eight, five, one. So that's one of them. So Hilbert functions. 
And another one would be 161061 and 161161, 161261. Okay, so now one thing about this is, um, so let's also assume if this is the case and R is not a complete intersection. In other words, uh, it's not, I is not generated by C, uh, a, a random, sorry, not random, is not generated by C uh, quadratic polynomials that form a complete intersection, uh, form a regular sequence. And in that case, they prove that these are the only four uh, Hilbert functions that can occur in, the, in these, this rare, this raw, so what is it? In, the, in the, the special case where the regularity of R is four and the C is five or six, this five or six is the, uh, is the co-dimension. And then the, these numbers, these are uh, symmetric because of the Gorenstein property. So now uh, the question is which ones actually occur. And uh, so they show that these all occur and they show that this one occurs in, uh, in characteristic small, like two or three or whatever. Okay, and um, so then they ask the question is, can this exist in characteristic uh, zero? So that's one question that comes out from this kind of thing. It, it, being quadratic Gorenstein is a pretty strong condition, and, uh, but it does appear in lots of geometric situations but it has strong uh, consequences on the Hilbert function and a lot of other things about it. They did a computer search and found lots of examples of this thing in Zeeman 2, but had trouble lifting it to characteristic zero. Okay. Okay, next, uh, next topic is uh, Kazool algebras. Okay, so definition. This is perhaps not the most uh, illuminating one, but it's the one that uh, is going to be easiest for what we want. R equals S mod I. Remember, S is singly graded, and I mean uh, standard graded, and I here is uh, is a homogeneous ideal always. So this is always graded, and that this is um, this has a linear. This is called Kazool. If, uh, if R, if K, which is R equal mod all the variables, um, has a, a linear um, R-free resolution. Mike, before yes? you continue, there is a question in the chat. Just look at it briefly. Um, the question is, how high C or R does one need to go for the H vector to possibly not uh, be unimodal? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think you have to go very far. Uh, maybe a couple more or something like that. I forget the exact number. Maybe someone else will know that. Oh yeah, here's, his, um, Jason writes down one. In fact, the, you know, one more. Yeah, the Stanley constructed one with 113, 12, 13, one is what it says as the Hilbert function or the H vector. And, uh, and in fact, I think, I, doesn't he get it to like the power two thirds or something like this uh, less or something? I forget the exact, uh, uh, exactly what happens with that. Um, well, were those examples quadratic? Uh, that's a good question. I guess the answer is no. From what Jason says, um, yeah, yeah. Actually, so I'm not actually considering those questions at the moment, but it would, they would be really pretty interesting ones to to consider. So anyway, if it has a linear um, R-free resolution, uh, so basically it's K. It starts with R. It goes to the um, R to the number of variables. And then it goes R to the minus one. Um, whoops, that's a minus one here. This is minus two and to some number and let's call that B2 and um, so on and so forth, okay? 
So it's every matrix along the way is, uh, is linear. And uh, so what's known about these things, so we're interested, this is true whether uh, these things are, uh, are Gorenstein or anything like that. So uh, what we have though is, uh, so what can we say about these things? So when is R Kazool, for instance? So th I think the best well-known well thing are some properties. Let's do properties or what do we know about this. We know it perhaps a lot. Um, the first thing I want to say is that uh, I, if I has a quadratic Grubner basis, uh, then um, R is Kazool. So in other words, if you, actually, if you can change coordinates to get yourself and choose an order such that you finally get a quadratic Grubner basis, then in fact, R is Kazool. So this follows from uh, work of Froberg and is in the paper um, with Eisenbud, uh, Reeves and Totaro and probably a, a number of other places that I'm not putting down, which I should. Um, Okay, so from uh, in the last paper there was in the early 90s and um, or sometime in the 90s and the Proberg paper is even earlier. Okay, so um, ba basically uh, uh, it, it's that the idea is that a square free monomial ideal or a monomial ideal generated by quadrix is Kazool and you can um, you can flat deform to it and then you get that this is also there. Okay, by the way, there are nice duality properties, but I think I'm going to leave that out due to time. Um, what I do want to say is that there is no known algorithm to determine this, at least not to me. And I would be very ha happy if, um, such a thing, if someone knows of such a thing. No known algorithm to determine if R is Kazool. Even in the quadratic case, as far as I know, um, and the trouble is, is that you have all these matrices. Here you have this map D1, D2, and D3, and you have an infinite number, and it's sort of a closed condition for it to, ha uh, at each point, uh, at each point for it to be nonlinear if you have a parameter of parameter space. So really that each one is giving you a, a set of conditions and unfortunately it's, uh, uh, it's an infinite number of conditions. So it's, it's sort of on a very open set that you will have Kazool on this. So how do you check all of these matrices? That's an excellent question, one that I would like to know. Of course, if you have a quadratic Grebner basis, everything's great, but unfortunately that's not always the case. In fact, I won't write it down, but Roos has the most amazing set of examples in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, one of his examples is a, just a set of ideals in six variables that has a parameter alpha. And the alpha is, uh, just appears in the constants. And it's a very simple ideal that you can write down. We, in fact, it's in, you know, I've seen it in Macaulay too lots of times. And when you run, when you do this, uh, the thing is, is is linear up through the step alpha if alpha is a positive integer and it fails at the step alpha plus one. So, and it's just very uh, nasty kind of, um, in my opinion, uh, a way of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of handling it. I mean, how do you then get a, uh, a algorithm that does that? Anyway, I would really like to know. Uh, Another thing, by the way, that's actually interesting is this isn't really a property, but this is a theorem by Finkelberg and Bishik in 93. And, uh, and I'm going to put these things together. Polishnok also, and there are other people involved as well. Um, but I'll leave it at that for the moment, is that if C is a canonical curve in PG minus 1, that imp and um, and uh, R, which is uh, S mod I C, is quadratically uh, Gorenstein. In other words, it's not a plain quintic or trigonal. Uh, then R is Kazool. 
And in fact, there's lots and lots of nice varieties in algebraic geometry that are Kazool. There are lots and lots of nice ones that are quadratic Gorenstein as well. And uh, so these are, uh, um, I think it's the Kazool stuff, at least I feel like it's still very mysterious though in some ways. Okay, so that's a good place for, for, for some questions. Um, are, are there any more? I guess I haven't seen any more come through. So I want to talk about what we want to do. So in this talk now, we're going to consider the following case. We're going to consider R, and we're going to assume it's quadratically Gorenstein. Quadratic Gorenstein is what I should really say. So it's quadratically, the ideal is quadratically generated and the um, ring is Gorenstein. And it's graded, of course. And uh, we're going to let R equal the regularity of R. And we're going to let C equal the codimension of the ideal I that is defined by this. So R is, as usual, is S mod I. And uh, so we have this situation. And the question is, uh, given this, um, is R, or must R be, I should say, must R be Kazool? In other words, we're going to consider the over all, if we're going to fix R and C, but consider all possible uh, quadratic Gorenstein in those situations. And we're going to see, ask if, it's, if it must be Kazool. So the reason we aren't saying, R, uh, is it Kazool or is it not, is for every single R and C that is going to be in some range, it's always going to be that there is some example that is quadratic in Gorenstein. So we can't really say, you know, is, is one of them, that doesn't make sense. So we'll, we're just going to consider this. So what is, what's known about this? Um, so uh, there's a few things known. One of them is that, uh, one is that R has to be less than or equal to C. This follows pretty easily. In fact, uh, even if it's Cohen Macaulay, it doesn't need to be uh, Gorenstein for this. So one, R has to be less than or equal to C um, this is, in fact, just, this doesn't depend on Kazoolness, okay? So just if we have a quadratic Gorenstein guy, this is always true. The second thing is if R is equal to C, we know that this is the same thing as I is a complete intersection. That's actually if and only if here. Um, and, uh, and what else is it? That implies uh, by Tate from 1957, which predates this. Oh yeah, I didn't actually say where this all came from. What, that was a bad. This is, came from Pretty in 1970. Uh, Define this in a very nice paper. So at any rate, so we have this uh, Tate 57 show, shows that R is Kazool. So now we're going to um, contain, go through a, a picture. There, there's the picture. So this is going to be all the R's and C's. Let's make this a little larger. R is this and C, R is a, along the column and C is along the rows. So this green line is when R equals C and those are all complete intersections. So, um, so this thing here, Whoops, that's not the right color. This is a complete intersection and therefore always Kazool. Okay, that's what the R equals C line is. And anything uh, in this area uh, um, up here is, uh, it can't happen because uh, R has to be less than or equal to C. Okay. Oh, did I um, screw up the, um, I, it looks like I misspelled um, Palishna. Um, oh yeah, wait, did I really screw that up? Okay, sorry about that. Where is that? Oops. Um, um, 
Oops, we'll just do that for now. Sorry about that. Okay, so the third thing that's known here uh, is uh, from a paper of Kanka, uh, uh, Rossi, and Vala in 2001. And they prove a few things. They prove if R is equal to two, uh, in other words, um, and for C, any C greater than or equal to two, uh, that uh, R is uh, Kazool. In fact, it has a, gr a quadratic Grovner basis. So, uh, so it isn't, I think, at least I believe that's the case. So that's going to be R equals two. They also um, consider using some of the stuff we're going to talk about. They consider R equals three and uh, C is equal to four and five. And actually, this is also part of, um, uh, Giulio Caviglia did uh, this also. And, see our, um, and this stuff here. They prove that in this case, that if this is the case, then uh, R is Kazool. And they ask the question, um, if R is equal to three and C is greater than or equal to uh, six, is R Kazool? Basically, they said they didn't find any. Okay, so let's go put those back on. And we'll do a little bit more before taking a break. Okay, so what part does that do? That's the blue line here. Um, so the blue line is R equals two is CRV, and these are Kazool. And then we also have two more cases which are Kazool, which are at R equals three, this guy here and this guy here. And so these are this and also with Kavilia. Okay, so those are all Kazool. So the question is, at this point, one starts seem, thinking, it's a pretty good uh, guess that everything is Kazool. Um, but that's when things start going bad. Uh, so what we have here is, um, uh, is an example of Matsuda. The paper came out in, or uh, was in 2017. The archive article appears to be at the end of 2016. What he shows, he finds, he found a toric ring R, which is S mod I. Okay, what does this mean? I, of course, is a polynomial ring, uh, um, which is quadratic Gorenstein. So uh, um, with, here I'll say something about that in a second with co-dimension uh, equal to seven and the regularity equal to four. So we found one of these guys, um, which is a toric ring, which means that this is binomial, a binomial prime. So it's generated by binomial quadratic polynomials and it's also prime ideal. Um, and so it's, it's quadratic Gorenstein, but it's not Kazool. Okay, so that's in co-dimension seven, regularity four. So let's go back up there. Sorry for the scrolling all the time here. Um, so we're going to, let's change to a different color for that. Something red because it's bad. Um, so it's not that bad, but at any rate, it's, um, these are the Matsuda. And there are examples in there, by the way, uh, that are Kazool, but there's that one example that's not. And that's in uh, regularity four and co-dimension seven, which is this. So this is, there exists a non kazool Okay, uh, by the way, because of that, you can, because you can tensor with a new K of a new variable on the variable squared, and that will keep quadratic and keep uh, non kazoolness you're going to keep getting all of these counterexamples as well. So you have all of those things. Um, his method is kind of cool. It, it 
it, you, it, he takes a very nice polytope and then takes the, uh, all the integral points in it, maps that into projective space, and that gives, and the ideal of that is the ideal. Um, but it doesn't seem to generalize. Uh, his technique of the way he constructs it gives you this one, uh, this is about the only case where it actually seems to work. Um, but he asks, um, let's go back to this. Do I have room for it? So the, uh, so he asks the question, um, can one find this? <laughs> can one find such an example? Such an example. Uh, for the co-dimension uh, less than seven, but still have the same regularity for. Okay, so uh, he take, took a look. And when I say such an example, I mean one that is quadratically Gorenstein and not Kazul. Okay. Um, so that's that. Uh, so, uh, so David asked the question. And about, um, are there Kazul examples in the Matsuda range? And the answer is yes. In fact, there are um, Kazuls in every single one of these non-blocked off uh, values. So, um, so this stuff up here cannot happen. These guys here don't happen. Regularity one is just too simple. Um, but uh, you can always do the following sort of thing. You can take, uh, if, if R is, uh, Kazool, you can tensor it with uh, k of a new variable mod t squared, and this will give Kazool. And uh, it has uh, it has if this if this had r and c, this will have r plus one um, because the you you the Sokol element will you'll just multiply by t, and uh, it'll have codimension one because uh, c plus one because you have that. So you can go all the way up uh, along. Uh, along these lines here uh, and always pick off Kazool's. So in fact, probably uh, the, the real problem here is that the generically uh, often on a very open set of all the parameter space of these things, if that even makes sense, which it is a little tricky whether, I mean, there is, are these Gorenstein parameter spaces, but they're a little complicated in this case, I think. And um, although, uh, uh, there's a lot, I think a lot can be said about that. Uh, but anyway, these things are going to, uh, non kazools are going to be some very weird set of those. I would like to understand that better. Okay, cool. So anyway, what I want to do now uh, is, uh, is fill in the rest of these things. So we're not going to do all of them at the moment because, uh, but in the paper, in the two papers we had, we fill in almost everything. Uh, so we're going to work mostly at the moment uh, on, on this stuff here. So we're going to work on, uh, there are several groups. We're going to work on these guys here uh, that we haven't got. Uh, then we will probably, uh, it will turn out we'll get these guys along this line here. And then that'll leave one more line here and that'll be a different argument. And we'll talk about that. And then we'll, at the end, if there's time, we'll talk about the uh, regularity three case, which is are the canonical curve case, for instance. And we know that everywhere along the, there, um, all these canonical curves, um, they're, uh, they are all Kazool. <laughs> so at any rate, so the question is, is what's going on on there? And uh, an interesting question. So we're gonna be talking about these things, at least some of them. Okay, so um, so the way we're going to do some of these things is the standard way that one deals with Gorenstein uh, rings is by inverse systems. So let's actually just go through this a little bit. So let's let S be a polynomial ring, say K of X1 to XC. And uh, D will let be K of Y1 to wide C. Be another polynomial ring and the same thing. And we're going to think of monomials in D. This is the divided power algebra, really, as fractions. But that's not really that important. So 
y1 to the beta, and at least at the moment, um, to y um, c to the beta c. Is, is that readable, that size? It looks like it probably is, okay? But if it's not, please let me know on the, uh, on the chat. So anyway, if this, let's call this y to the beta, where beta is the exponent vector. This, I wanna think of this as a fraction one over x to the beta. And then I have uh, S acting on D, X on D, by the following. X alpha will act on Y to the beta by just sort of multiplying monomials, except where Y to the beta is one over X to the, uh, uh, one over X to the beta. So this will be Y to the beta minus alpha. If every element of the vector beta minus alpha is, is greater than or equal to zero. In other words, if it's an allowed monomial, and otherwise, zero uh, otherwise. Okay, so this is the action of S on uh, D. We could have chosen another action. We could have chosen the action where we use differentiation um, by the uh, D by DX alpha on, on, on a monomial X to the beta. But uh, in either way is fine. It doesn't really matter in, this, in the setting we're in. Um, so if you, we let, D, let F be in D, so remember D is the, this, uh, the polynomial ring in uh, Y's here. If we let F be in D be homogeneous of degree R, we can define uh, F perp, uh, which is the set of G and S, where G annihilates F. So this is just the annihilator of the um, F uh, or the module generated by F, the S module generated by F. And this is contained in S as an ideal. And uh, this is a great concept if you've not ever seen it, but it's, it has a nice description in um, David's uh, um, commutative algebra book uh, on zero dimensional Bornstein. Otherwise, I forget exactly what section that is, but in any case. Uh, so here's an example. So this is, oh, wait, actually, before doing the example, let me just say a couple of things. So uh, what we have is, this is called the, um, uh, the inverse system of F, or the inverse system of this ideal I is F itself. So that's where the term comes from. And there's also a Macaulay 2 package which uh, David wrote. Actually, uh, I'm not sure who all the authors are of that at the moment, but uh, uh, it, it, this Macaulay 2 package is called inverse systems, which is preloaded in the system. Inverse systems. Which we'll actually play around with in a little bit, in a little while. So an example might be the following. If I take F is equal to uh, XY plus XZ plus YZ, contained in, um, uh, oops, I should have used Y1, Y2, Y3, but let's just suppose we have that. Um, F perp, uh, okay, I'm using the same uh, set of variables for this. This is gonna be the ideal generated by, I'm gonna use the same ones, I guess, that's probably, perhaps not a good idea. X squared, Y squared, and Z squared, and uh, XY minus XZ, and XY minus YZ. So this is the same uh, as our first example. This is the co-dimension three uh, Gorenstein. So the, a proposition which is proved in David's book is that if F, this actually one is maybe not actually that hard yet. If F is in DR, is, in other words, is homogeneous of degree R and I is equal to F perp, which is in this ideal in S, and R is the quotient as usual. Then we have several um, pretty easy things. The first one at least is R is finite length, uh, because any polynomial of, uh, of degree greater than R will annihilate it. Uh, R is Gorenstein, because we're taking the annihilator of a singly generated um, uh, a module in, inside of the divided power algebra, but that's not a proof. Um, and uh, the regularity of R, 
is r, which is equal to the Sockel degree of r. So this is where, this is the last degree, remember, where it, it exists. So r sub r is not equal to zero. In fact, it's one dimensional and r, r plus one is zero. So those, this is a way of generating uh, Gorenstein rings, at least finite length ones or Artinian ones. And that's, uh, that's usually enough because, uh, because you can always reduce to that case pretty easily. So then the theorem is that uh, uh, every uh, Gorenstein finite length Rated, of course, uh, regularity of R equals R uh, uh, case um, here, uh, R arises as uh, R is equal to S modulo F perp for some F in uh, D sub R. Okay, so, uh, and oh yeah, so it's in um, Eisenbud, uh, uh, 21.2 in his book. Um, it has a nice proof of this. Uh, and so this allows us easily in Macaulay 2 and then theoretically to actually generate Gorenstein uh, algebras. Uh, what's the problem with it? Well, alas, it's very hard. It's hard to control the Hilbert function of this uh, of this ring of this uh, this ideal f um, perp. There's a, uh, there's a there's a book by um, Tony Urbino and and Pontev that uh, not um, wait who is uh, is that the book that I want to say yes it is that uh, their book uh, has a lot of information on this kind of stuff not um, and. Uh, but it's also hard to uh, to get quadratic generation. Panef is what I meant to say, by the way. Sorry about that. Um, hard to get quadratic generation. Okay. By the way, just as a as a interesting side note and. Uh, not sure how much time we have for it, but uh, in in the the uh, Conca Rossi Valla 2001 paper, they prove the following kind of thing: If I take a cubic polynomial uh, in here, if this defines a smooth uh, hypersurface, and it's a cubic hypersurface in projective C minus one space. Uh, then, in fact, the corresponding ring R, which is S mod F um, uh, burp, is, uh, well, in, actually for cubics, it's most, almost always going to be quadratically uh, generated. So that's not, and it's always going to be Gorenstein by this, this stuff. So th the question is, is it Kazool? And if it's smooth, it is Kazool. They actually prove a lot more than this. Uh, they prove, uh, yeah, Conf. Wait, what did I say? <laughs> okay, wait a second. So see Conef and Irobino or Irobino Conef. So sorry about that. I'm buzzing out. What can I say? Sorry. So anyway, so we have that if F is in uh, D3 uh, and we get it in its smooth hypersurface, then it is Kazool. So but and they also prove a, a number of things about if it's uh, singular of certain kinds, it actually still is Kazool. And this is when they started asking whether they're always Kazool or not, is where, is the, is where that question came up. So what we want to do, though, is now consider the case of, let's just consider the case of regularity four. So we're going to consider the case of um, R is equal to S mod I. Uh, regularity is four. The co-dimension is C. 
And uh, at the moment, it's going to be sort of larger at the moment. Uh, we'll see what it has to be. Uh, and of course, graded and uh, finite length and all that. So the question is, does R quadratically, uh, quadratic in Gorenstein, so if, sorry, let me say this again. If R is quadratic Gorenstein, must R be Kazool or are there examples where it's not? Okay. And we know that for um, C equals uh, seven, uh, that's the Matsuda example. But it doesn't seem to generalize. So the question is, is how, is this a, a, a just as uh, an ex, a, a exceptional kind of case or does this happen all the time? So the theorem uh, that we prove, or one of the theorems that we prove, is that we're gonna let S be a K adjoin X1 to X7. Uh, sorry, not X7, XC, where C is greater than or equal to seven. Notice this does not, this includes the Matsuda case, but not the ones he was asking about before, about uh, C equals five or six. Okay, so we have this, and now we're going to just, this um, is, we're gonna let F be the following sum, where I think of the indices uh, on the x1 to xc as being numbers mod c, uh, and I'm, I take yi, yi plus one, remember these are in the dual y's, yi plus two squared, and this is in d4. Um, then r equals s mod f perp satisfies the following. A, R is quadratic. Of course, yeah, the, actually um, David says that the, the result requires using differentiation instead of contraction. That's exactly correct. So, um, so I was hoping to sweep that one completely under the rug, but it, but it just changes the coefficients a, a, a little bit. So at least I think that's all it does. And so R is quadratic. Um, and, uh, and of course it's, uh, Gorenstein because it's coming about from this construction. Uh, second one is the Hilbert function, uh, is, of R is one C, two C, C one. And the third one is R is not Kazool. Okay. So I'm not gonna to say too much about the proof of this. I mean, in some ways, once you have the polynomial, it's not so bad. You calculate what the um, annihilator of it is and you find some very nice quadrics in it. And, uh, <clears throat> and then you prove that they generate and that gives you the part A. And also uh, the Hilbert function has to be of the form one comma C comma something, comma C comma one by duality. And so once you have the number of quadratic generators and you know that it generates, uh, then that number is fixed to be, in this case, 2C. And so the non kazualness you, you actually get because you can find a, a quadratic second syzygy on those generators of F perp. That's uh, a very nice one to write down. Uh, that is not in uh, the, it is not uh, in the submodule of syzygies generated by the kazool syzygies and the linear uh, uh, syzygies. And, and that implies that it's not Kazool. Okay, so this is, um, this is this thing and it works for C greater than or equal to seven. We're gonna say something about C equal to six. Now, th there's another question though. Why did we ever come up with, with this? Um, I mean, uh, it's a very nice one. So you might say, well, you just write it down. But in fact, that's not the way it worked. Um, what happened is actually, I'm telling the story backwards we really uh, proved first, whoops, where is it? We proved first, uh, let's give ourselves a, a, um, another, not red, but sort of red thing. We proved that um, for nine and 10 and higher here, that uh, there exist uh, non-Kazools. 
uh, for re r equals three and r greater than or equal, and c greater than or equal to nine. Um, by the way, um, Jason McCullough just a uh, couple weeks ago, I think, um, was able to use the same use the construction that we have for um, creating non um, counterexamples to this kind of thing, and use an example of Roos and put all that together in a nice way and get this case here. So that's um, so that case is uh, Jason. Uh, um, so this is MSS um, and also Jason McCullough for the uh, for the uh, C equals eight R equals three case. Okay, um, and Alexandra did that too. Sorry, and Alexandra Sicelliano. Okay. Um, thank you. So anyway, so we have those cases, but the, the, the way we did it is, so that came about from another construction using Nagata's idealization. And, but then we could work backwards once we had these, uh, these uh, things, we could take their, dual, their inverse systems, you could take a look at them and you get these nice cubics that were actually pretty sparse. And all of a sudden it gave you an idea of where really to look uh, for that. So, and then it took, uh, then it wasn't immediate, but then finally this very nice one came up. But what I wanna do now is spend a few minutes, uh, I wanna move to Macaulay 2 and just show you what some of these things are like if you have not uh, seen them. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a bit and I'm going to, actually I'm gonna share my screen, but this time I'm gonna share the Emacs screen. Okay. So I'm just going to do a few examples. I can't see the chat, by the way. So if there's any question on it while I'm doing this, uh, uh, Irina, if you could uh, let me know, that would be great. So, uh, so- Yes, Mike, Mike yeah. there are questions. So um, here they are. In this setting, can you get examples where the resolution is linear for a few steps in the beginning and fails linearity only later? Uh, you mean um, over the, you mean the re resolution over the ring R? Uh, that's what you're talking about, right? So um, the yeah. answer is that all of the examples that we're doing fail at the very simplest step where the Kazool um, syzygies uh, and the linear syzygies do not generate all of the, um, the, the syzygies. Uh, it I think, think it would be really interesting to understand the loci in these parameter spaces where it fails at each of these spots. And uh, that's something that uh, I'd really like to think about. And, and but probably uh, many of you know a lot more. So if you know anything, please let me know. Okay, so the second question. Yep, oh, there, is one more question. there is one more question. Does the failure of Kuzunis occur arbitrarily far out? Um, that's a good question. So when an open question, I think it's, I don't know if it's open. Uh, I don't think I saw any examples in the Roos's list where, of things like this that happen that were quadratic Gorenstein. So they usually have embedded components and are sort of slightly nasty. So um, although maybe there are also Corn Macaulay one, examples that do it, but that are not Gorenstein. So, but I don't know if I, I don't think I know of any examples uh, where for quadratic Gorenstein that you can't have it, you can have it happen uh, that it fails arbitrarily far out, but that might, that's probably just a uh, lack of knowledge on my part. I, I'm not sure I would imagine that true. It would be kind of cool though, if you, if that would, was true, then we could actually find an, at least in, in principle, have an algorithm for it. Um, so I just wanted to show some of these things, like in six variables here, here's a random uh, um, quadratic polynomial. And if we look at the, uh, the inverse system of it, Whoops, that's interesting. Um, okay, so here we have this, and uh, if we look at the Betty diagram of it, of its free resolution, we see that it's generated by twenty quadratic polynomials, and it's nice and has a very nice uh, resolution, and so on and so forth. This is the kind of thing that happens. Um, in Sockel degree or uh, regularity two, uh, but uh, you, uh, lots of nice things happen there. How about cubics? 
So this is the canonical curve case, essentially. If I take in six variables again, I take a random, uh, a random cubic and I take its inverse system. I'm not showing the ideal because it's just too nasty. And I take its degrees. This is, the, uh, uh, this is what I obtain. So, um, so this is, uh, you know, if, if we actually check on this to see if it's, I don't know if we can, if I actually did this, um, but that one will um, almost certainly be Kazool, okay? But I, what I'm really um, trying to point out is that these things are just, just random guys are giving us quadratic generation. What about quartics? Okay, quartics, that would be really nice. That would be this whole R equals four line. If I take a random one and I take its inverse system, I take its, um, its minimal uh, resolution and it's the Betty diagram of it, I get, I'm generated by 50 cubics. There's not a single quadratic in the uh, ideal. So this is, the, herein li lies the problem with using this to say anything about quadratic uh, generation. By the way, uh, here's Matsuda's example. Um, it's in variables um, x0 through x7 and then these weird ones, which are supposed to be thinking of x sub 1 comma 2, x sub 2 comma 3. And here is the ideal uh, that gives that. And here's the free resolution of it. It's generated by 14 quadrics and so on. And the ring is this, and we can actually just compute uh, the resolution of the co-kernel of the variables of R, which is K, and do it up to degree four, and even to degree three, it, it, um, this is where it pops up the one. So that means one of these quadratic generators, I believe, is not in the, uh, is in this, not in the Kazuel syzygies at union, those 21 linear ones. It's not generated by that. Okay, so now I want to show the, um, and if you just try to find things that are quadratically generated, it's just really not uh, feasible, even finding it by uh, random search. Um, you could do it in small characteristic, um, but really small characteristic. Here's the F um, of C for, that we just had. So it's, um, it's the sum of Xi, Xi plus one, Xi plus two squared. And this is just a hack. So I can actually uh, not have to write the code hard. I just write the other two terms that wrap around. And so the polynomial, for instance, for um, C equals seven is this. And if I take its inverse system, I get some pretty nice thing. It's, it's, um, it's generated by quadrics. Um, let's just uh, do the minimal Betty diagram. It, this is exactly the same as the Matsuda example. So in fact, this is an Artinian reduction of the Matsuda example. Um, and we can actually take a look at its, uh, the, the, this thing, which also fails in the same places as it should. Okay, so that's um, and this works for all c greater than or equal to seven. Now you might say, well, that was a pretty nice polynomial, though. What happens in six variables? Okay, so uh, what is the inverse system of this? Alas, it has two cubic generators in it, and we can take its inverse system. Uh, oops, sorry, I, that was the inverse system. And then we can take its Betty diagram and see the two cubic generators. There's no chance that this will be, uh, that this will be Kazuo because of those cubic generators. Um, actually, I know, I'm not sure I actually ever said that, but uh, if it's Kazuo, it's generated by quadrics. So, uh, so anyway, so here's another example. So suppose we take that F and we just start modifying it. If I, I'm just adding a monomial at random, X1 squared, X3 squared. I actually get, uh, in this case, less quadrics in the ideal. So it's, it's somehow making it worse. Now, if I do a different one, uh, I get seven quadrics. I get a little bit more. I just took x1, x3 squared. But now, after um, some sort of uh, search, uh, if you do this one, where you add two new monomials to it, we can do that one. And the inverse system here, OK, this is in, I did this in finite characteristic. It would, works in anything. And, uh, 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 and here is the minimal Betty diagram of it. It's actually generated by nine quadrics. By the way, an interesting thing is th these 40 quadrics cannot possibly be generated. Uh, um, well, they, won't, they're, they certainly aren't generated as part of these four. Um, but uh, the number of Kazul syzygies is nine choose two, which is 36. 
So these uh, can't possibly uh, uh, exist. So in fact, let's actually try computing that. And in fact, we, we get a, a number of them are, are actually not in there. So in fact, what we have here is that for C equals six, uh, we get this. By the way, what's the Hilbert function of this guy, of, um, of s to the one mod i? Well, we can just do i here. And we reduce Hilbert, that will give us the, uh, that will divide by the one minus, whoops, do I not have an i? Hilbert series. If I do that, I get one, six, 12, six, one. This was the each vector that, uh, that uh, what happened? Well, let's see, this was one of the ones that uh, Migliori and Nagel were wondering whether it existed or not. Um, we could have done this whole thing in characteristic zero and see that this thing works. And we, we do find such an example in this case. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the, um, to the iPad now and uh, finish this off and Let's see, what's our timing here? We have a little bit more time. Um, so let's, let me do that right now. And if there, while I'm doing that, if you have any other questions, um, please let me know. I can't see it yet, but I, in a second I'll be able to see um, the chat window. Got no more questions now. Okay, good. Okay, so what we have here is we also have um, also there exists such an example. For uh, for uh, c equals six. Okay, so now let's go back to our picture. If I can find it. Okay, you can see this on my on the screen, right? So what this says is that in fact we've just found examples in all of these cases which of course gives all these cases. Uh, we actually give the, uh, uh, this, this one too, and it, all these examples in a sense generalize the Matsuda one, although I don't have toric rings, we don't have toric rings that do that. However, we also, it also gave us the next one down. So none of these exist. Okay, so in that, uh, sorry, when I say none of them exist, they, none of them are always Kazuo. In fact, I don't know why I said that. It's, there's it exists a non kazool one there. So what's left at, at this point? Uh, well, we, there's not that much. Uh, we can start with, uh, we have this one diagonal up here, all of these guys along here. And then we have these two guys here. So let's, uh, let's deal with the, um, the uh, off diagonal ones first. Um, okay, whoops, let's change back color. Okay, so now we're interested in uh, the case where R has the following properties. This is S mod I, of course, where the co-dimension uh, is equal to, uh, oops, here, let me get my notes out. Uh, so the co-dimension will be C and R, the regularity will be C minus one. So that's the, uh, that off diagonal entry. So EG, for instance, uh, uh, at R equals four and C equals five, what is the uh, Hilbert function of the, such an R going to be? Well, it's gonna be, it has embedding dimension five, so it's gonna be one five. It's gonna be something here, and it's gonna be five and one here. Okay, so this H2. So this is the kind of thing that we're looking at, but, but of course we're gonna be doing it for um, all of these cases. Actually, Migliore and Nagel in the same paper um, uh, that show that if uh, R is quadratic in Gorenstein and R is equal to C minus one, in other words, we're in this above case, uh, then the Hilbert function of R is uniquely determined and, and we can write it down. Okay, uh, 
in particular, uh, what that tells us is that I is generated by, if it's quadratic Gorenstein, it's generated by C plus two quadrics. So it has deviation two. Um, so uh, that's what, what kind of situation we're in. It's generated by C plus two quadrics. And actually the Hilbert function also shows that it has five linear syzygies. Okay. Oops, we're at the end of that. Okay. So the theorem then that we prove in uh, one of these two papers in the second one is uh, given the situation R quadratically, quadratic in Gorenstein, where R is equal to C minus one, then uh, we get a structure theorem for it. Then, uh, and this is S mod I, uh, then I is equal to the Fafians, uh, the four by four Fafians of the matrix M, which I'll say something about, and a bunch of other quadrics, Q6 up to Q uh, C plus two. So this is going to have five quadrics and M here, where M is five by five skew symmetric, linear matrix, and the Fafians, um, the four by four Fafians, there's five of those, uh, is uh, Gorenstein co-dimension three. Okay, where that, and then uh, the Q6 to QC plus two is a regular sequence mod um, the Fafian ideal. So th this is the case, and therefore uh, R, so uh, I probably didn't say it above, but the, uh, the ring uh, given by the quotient by the Fafians is Gorenstein, uh, sorry, is Kazool, and whenever you add by uh, such a complete intersection like this, that's a regular sequence, it stays Kazool, and then therefore you get that R here which is S mod I, uh, is Kazool on this entire stretch. And the, the proof is, um, is, is pretty cool. It, it, it goes through, it uses linkage and all this kind of uh, stuff. And uh, it sort of generalizes the methods that uh, Matt Mastroini used in his thesis um, from a few years ago. Okay, so that is, uh, that gives us the uh, this, the following um, part, uh, let's use it, the color, um, like some, one of these blue colors here. That gives us all these are all Kazool. There'll be an example of those. And now we're left with two lousy examples. And uh, alas, these guys here are open. <laughs> We don't know the answer of, of those yet. Can't find any, um, any such ideal that does it, but yet uh, proving that, it's, uh, that they're all Kazool um, just seems hard. So uh, that would be a good thing to, to take a look at. Um, a couple things um, about this, by the way. Um, one thing I didn't mention just now, which I meant to, is uh, way down here, this, we have such an ideal for C equals six. This has actually, uh, this has a Hilbert function one, six. It's the same as the one C, two C, one, six, 12, six, one. Uh, wait, did I mention that? I did already mention that. That's the, um, that's the, end, that's the one that exists uh, that Matsuda was asking about. Um, sorry about that. I just phasing out here. So I just wanted to then now just do one little thing with uh, some open problems and then we'll call it quits. Open, I'm gonna say open questions. I don't know what an open question is, <laughs> but that's, these are gonna be the, uh, what they are, okay? So, uh, 
So of course, the, the first one is, uh, if R is quadratically Gorenstein, and R is equal to three, and C is equal to uh, six, or C equals seven, does that imply question mark that R is Kazool? No question? Uh, if we consider just the, uh, the R equals four case, for the moment, and let's just actually for the moment take C less than or equal to six. We know from uh, Miliori Milior and Nagel in 2013 that their Hilbert function was one of the following: one five eight five one, one six one six one six, and ten eleven or twelve, and this was six 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 and one one one. There were, these four cases were what happened. The one five eight five one is one of the ones that goes under our Kazool heading. And then this one, there exists a non kazool That was the, uh, the example that we um, came up with that we were going through. And then the question is here, does there exist a non kazool or are these always kazool So, you know, it's just um, it's more of along those lines. And then um, the other one is the more geometric stuff. So suppose we consider uh, the Gorenstein, say Gor of T, this is the one of the definitions where T is equal to the Hilbert function. So if you fix a Hilbert function, you can consider all the polynomials that give you uh, either that or something, you know, some upper semi-continuous thing from that. And uh, I would like to identify in here uh, locus or components of quadratically Gorenstein um, ideals. That would be one thing. Another one would be the locus um, where uh, Kazoolness fails. At step n. And can we say something nice and geometric about that? I mean, these are after all hypersurfaces, which are actually pretty hard objects, but uh, but anyway, there's that. So I think uh, that's all I want to say right now. I don't think I have any other time uh, to include any of the proofs uh, other than what we've already seen so far. So, uh, so anyway, so I, I'll leave it at that. And so thanks very much.